New York and on the new Hot 97 app, Ebro in the Morning. On Hot 97. Ebro in the Morning. Okay. Rosenberg. Hey. No wrestling shirt. No, just to a talk about. Quebec Nordique shirt that my Random. wife's aunt gave me. Shout out to Pharrell on the kicks. Thank you. Uh, and Theo Rossi. Yeah. Yo, Luke Cage. Yes. Man. Yeah, Back was, again Friday. Yep. Midnight tonight. So yeah, tonight yeah, now. It's on. They'll be re- people have already watched it by noon tomorrow. They stay up all night. Did you go to the wow. uh, Did you go to the Kennedy Center event or not? I did not. My, my brother was there. I, came, yeah. I just watched. Yeah. On 47th Street. Um, I'm not going to give the location, but um, there's a whole. They're redoing it again. KRS. Oh really? D nice. Jada D- Kiss. Jada what day? Gary Clark uh, tonight. Gary tonight. Clark Junior. Um, Faith. Faith Evans, yeah. um, um, Ali Shahid Muhammad, yeah. and, and Adrian, Adrian Young, Young. And their midnight hour collective group that they have. Oh, tonight. what? Really? Yeah. yeah. Damn. Tonight. Rock I'm Kim's going to close it and down. A premiere, what? And, a, and, a and they'll episode. show the first two episodes. First two episodes. Yep. That's how we do it. On the soundtrack, I'm allowed to say this. Yeah, everybody, it's out now. It's out now. Uh, the There's an original Rock Kim joint. New joint. by Ali Shahid and uh, Adrian Young. Wow, About that's fire Luke too. Cage. About he, Luke Cage, yeah. like an actual soundtrack song. He did all his, like, he basically created this whole thing about two seasons. It's Watching it live was one so of for, the for, amazing things. So ever. for a comic book fan yourself, yes, how big of a deal was it to be a part of this, Luke Cage? The biggest, it's the biggest Marvel TV show? I, I don't know. Easily. I've, Easily. I mean, it's it, because there's nothing like it. And I said this last night on something. It's like... You know, and anybody can come at me on it. There's nothing like it on television. There's nothing even close that combines hip hop and history and the drama of like gangster stuff. So it's got that like Sopranos wire, but then you're adding in that like what New York Undercover used to do with the, the live acts in the club and then the history of Harlem, the history of New York. And then obviously and a black man the, being a hero, a bulletproof black man. Yo, I, you, you, you're, you're selling today. me big, big on this. This, this is. This, this, I was well, you're living. not a big Marvel guy. No, right? I'm not a big. Let's, I'm not a big comic. A thousand. You're not a big comic. But book. it's not, not a comic even. book show, right? But that he's selling me. That was a great elevator pitch, though, on on, on that show. Yeah, that sounded awesome. So, as a as a kid uh, who grew up loving comic books, mm-hmm. right? When this opportunity presented itself, how did it? Because you were on Sons Anarchy, yep. so you've already been on a big show. Yeah, this opportunity presents itself, and I was like, I'm, 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 I'm good with television for a minute. Sons was. Eight years in total of chaos, you know, and it changed my life. It was like chaos in what sense? I was a journeyman actor. I've been doing this 18 years. And in 2008, 2009, I get sons and we don't know what it's going to be. I'd never been on something where it was like a cult following of like, so your whole life changes. In a in a great way, but your whole life changes. You're now part of this like cast, and every year comic cons, and like you you're going all over the world, and it was like wow, this is like and and your whole identity becomes that television show, and I was like this is amazing, this is great. So I was like right after it ended, I was like let's go. We were doing two movies in a row, and I was like let's jump into the film game. But my homie Charles Murray, who wrote and directed Sons of Anarchy, and then Cheo. Hidari Coker, who wrote the movie Lowriders that I was just doing, he was the showrunner of Luke Cage. And when I found that out and I saw what they were doing with Daredevil and the Marvel shows and mainly Marvel Netflix, how they weren't comic book stuff. They were really more like dark dramas. And I was like, man, with them. And then when the hip hop element was told to me, I was like, it's, I had a chance to move back to New York. And, and I was like, OK. And. It was and, and it. For, for people who don't know, you're a Staten Island native. Yeah, Brooklyn and Staten Island. Yeah, Brooklyn and Staten Island. Yeah. Um, and you recently uh, moved, like you said, you moved. But um, talk about the hip hop component of your passions as a kid. So, like most of us, I mean, I'm I'm not to age myself. I mean, I was a skateboarding kid, like we were just talking about with your daughter, and I was skateboarding, riding my Mark Gonzalez vision board, and like literally, you know, we had heard. Rapping Duke, the ha, the ha. We had heard, you know, uh, Jam on it and Rob Bass used to come perform and sat down. But then, like, Public Enemy hit in 83, and my whole life changed. Or 86. 80, no, 83. Public Enemy? Yeah, what was it? 80, no, 86. 86. 86. So I was 11. Oof, yeah. Just aged myself. Yeah, there you go. And my whole life changed. Well, you look great. And Man, by the way, here's the thing about age. You look 30, maybe. Yeah, you 20, do, by the way. I was 20. very surprised when you said 
ra- but the first thing you said was rapping Duke the Ha yeah. the Ha. Yeah. I was like, oh wow, he's much older than me, and yeah. I did because I wouldn't have thought because that, that was the four. But that was like the forty five, the cool kid, the neighbor who was the Raiders were his favorite team. Like he was the badass in the neighborhood. Like he had that. And Shout then, to the Raiders. Yeah, and then it's my team. And then because of him, like he was the cool kid in the neighborhood. And, and he, he had the, the 45 Raiders. for Rap and Duke. 45 for Rap and Duke. And it was like, we would listen to that. And then when Public Enemy hit, it was like everything changed. So it became hip hop. But what really changed for me in my life was Wu-Tang because I had never heard someone say where you were from and everyone else was hearing it. It was like, when you told people you're from Staten Island, they're like, oh, sorry about that. Like, we don't go there. Nobody went there. Like, Staten Island was always the outcast. Of, of course. Still is in a lot of ways. For sure. But for a moment, Woo. when 36 Chambers comes out, it changes the game for everybody on the island because you have your identity now. You've changed because we had a specific identity and a lot of us weren't with that identity. But then that came and you were like, oh, okay. Here we are. And when you say a specific identity, you're talking about racism and I'm, assholes in Staten Island who are racist. I'm just talking about the way, just just the way the island was perceived. But this is back then. It was perceived a specific way. It's perceived a specific way now. And now that changed it, though. It gave a second identity, which is we just love Wu-Tang. We're kids and we're from Staten Island. We're proud now and that we have something. you talk to Meth and he'll tell you. I mean, the, 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 the funny thing about any place, you know, we live in Austin now. It's like Austin, Texas is not... A lot of what maybe the rest of, you know, Texas. Texas is. You know, it's like every place is different. And it's like with, with Staten Island, it's separated into certain, you know, areas and certain places. Like any place. You no, know, like any place. You segregated, separated. Yeah. All, like my, like-minded people live next to one another, right. generally speaking. That's all over. But at the same everywhere. time, once you heard Capadonna go, I'm Staten Island's best, son, fuck what you heard. You have now a, a phrase. You now have a... A Shaolin, refrain. Shaolin Allen was like, Shaolin. it changed everything. And and again, it didn't just change it. It wasn't like, it was like the greatest, like they changed the game for so many reasons because nobody had heard anything. Nobody had heard this many people on a track and this many, and like the way, and still, still. I mean, the last I wonder few. if I was forced to like think of what hip hop is in a heartbeat if anything comes up before Wu-Tang for people of our age range. You know, like Dave Chappelle has the bit when he's like, sometimes you just got to do something and scream Wu-Tang. And he's yeah. always making that his thing. is like, do some crazy shit and scream Wu-Tang. Because, it's so me, built into our DNA. Because to me, there was hip hop. And then and there was always now when you go back, you're like, oh, Rakim had that. And certain people had that kind and of. Wu-Tang shocked the system. That's what it is. And it, and it was a worldwide phenomenon. And it was based, it wasn't just because the rhymes were good. It was the whole vibe, well, everything. And the, and the, the, the Kung dimensions. Kung and the Marvel right, references. Yeah, the dimensions. And John Blaze. And, but and, then also the, the topics that were covered on an individual record by different MCs. When you look at w- what ODB would be talking about to what the Jizzle was talking about, you're like... And then mainstream and street, yeah. right? So it was w- worshipped yeah. in the street culture and then worshipped in the mainstream culture. And I don't think they were they were basically superheroes in the rap culture in yes. every way. Yes. Do you think maybe this would be a good time that we just take a moment and break down what Old Dirty's ad libs are at the beginning, beginning of Triumph? The, the ground that he covers as an artist. Go ahead. Oh, you thought me. you wasn't going to see, see me? me? I'm the Osiris <laughs> of this shit. <laughs> shit. Wu-Tang is here forever, motherfuckers. I'm one of uh, the best opening next. It, all right, my my ends and my anorets. Um, uh, um, I'm going to break it down like this. I'm going to rub your ass to the moonshine. moonshine. <laughs> what? Let's take, take it back, back to, to 79. 79. Yo, Atomically. Then, then we start the rap. What? You know, that's all dirty, man. And then look what they go into. One of the best Atomically, Socrates philosophies, hot pot the seat. That's I one mean, of the best ever. That part right there. I'll be dropping. What? <laughs> that's, so, so to me, it was like you're hearing that, and at the same time, we're getting like Gangstar was just like everybody was like so. So you're a big hip hop fan. You're a skate kid. You're on Staten Island. You're reading yeah. comic books. Yeah. Um. And then you, how do you become moved to actor? LA? Uh. Well, I was. I was in. I was going the wrong route so of you, life. What you mean? What were you doing? I was just going. I was just. I was just doing what I. I thought I was supposed to do, which was make money. So At a young hustling. age, you was I was hustling. I just thought that's the way, what you do. You make money. However you have to make money, you make money. And that's it. So you're not from, like, your background, you, you're you from a middle class family? Mm-hmm. You're from a... My father left when I was young. My mother did everything she had to do. 
The only thing we had that represented us was this. My father was, you know, a criminal, went to jail. He, uh, the only thing he bought us was this really nice house. My mother was lucky enough to keep it. It was a beautiful, big, giant house, and it was me and my sister, and uh, and that was it. And I, that's it's interesting held- to have a giant house but not have anything else. Yeah, no. So that's that's the funny thing about life, right? Perception is not necessarily reality. And so everyone I, thought I you also, were popping because you were the kid with the nice house. But I was also the first kid I ever met and the first kid I only knew whose father left. Like, no, I never knew anyone who was the I didn't even understand the concept. Do you know what I'm saying? So it was like, but then it was told to me in a way of like, oh, he had gotten in trouble. And there was, and there was again, there was always this element that was going on on the island of, of what it is. And everybody knows it. There was just, there's three kinds of people on Santa Island. There's, you know, cops, firemen, and criminals. And that's kind of just the way it was. And and it was like, okay, so we, do you just do what you got to do and you figure it out. So I started, you know, your hustle is weird. You start from delivering newspapers to doing this to then just making money. You get your, your, you get your work permit and you start working and then you start going into other things because you go, oh, well, if I'm getting 275 an hour to do this, but I can make. $200 if I just do this and that takes five minutes. Well, that's stupid. Why would I do that? So you do that. And it just makes more sense if you look at the numbers of it all. So for me, then I went up to Albany. I went up to school in Albany. and SUNY? Every, yeah, I went to SUNY Albany. And all my friends went up. And I was going to play football because that's what I thought I was supposed to do. Because I came out of a school that really we only lost like three games and Won the state championship, Monsignor Farrell. Okay. And I went there going, thinking, I went and I was recruited by a bunch of different schools, uh, Canisius and Catholic University, and I thought, okay, we're all going to go together and take over this program, and that's what we're going to do. But now, again, we talked about this. It was like the time when, like, grunge was popping, and, like, we were getting conscious of, like, Bukowski and reading stuff, and, like, you were, like, you're, you're hitting that age where you're like, and again, hip hop is this is a lot going on in hip hop and we're getting more towards conscious rappers and we're listening to things where people have, you start getting into that mindset where you think you have all the answers at like 16, 17 and sports kind of became like petty to me. I was like, I don't, I don't care about football. I care about what's going on with this. Like this is all wrong. And you're hearing Kurt Cobain say that this is how, ha- and, and you just, your mindset changes. So when I went up there, it wasn't what I thought it was, and I dropped out. And I was like, I'm not doing this. This is not for me. School's not for me. I'd rather just make money. There was one of my friend's mothers who passed away, who was this amazing soul, who convinced me to go back. And when I went back, one of the things she told me was just be completely different than you were. Don't be, don't be you. Like, just do everything opposite. Almost like that Seinfeld opposite mm-hmm. uh, show, uh, George. Be opposite, opposite summer, whatever. So I did everything opposite. But what that led me to was, okay, well, if I'm going to do everything opposite, I'm going to do, I had my whole crew up there. I'm going to do everything that I can to, to take care of me and to, to make sure that I can stay there and make as much money as possible. And that's what I did. And when I got in trouble for like the third time, I was like, okay, I have options now. Basically, I can stay up here and do this. Because there was a lot of stuff that had happened. Or I can come back and figure something else out. I had no idea what I was going to do. I didn't have any discernible skills except making money. I didn't know anything else. I knew you were I, selling everything at that point. You're selling whatever. I was focused on one thing. Right. I was focused on one thing. I had graduated to one thing that I was focused on. And you got in on. trouble for that? No, I got in trouble for fighting a lot. Got it. And I got, and I got really lucky. And again, you got to remember, this is the 90s. So things had were very different and when I got I got lucky that someone who had taken me in had known me through something and they put me in a in a in a drunk tank instead of a a cell and there was a thing that happened that made me realize so I came out and I just like I gotta get out of here so I went home I graduated and uh I didn't know what I was going to do. And I had a friend who called me up and he was in an acting school. I didn't know. And I went there to meet him. And it was on 15th and 5th in Manhattan. And, uh, and this dude was like, you know, he was a good looking, you know, younger kid. And I saw all these like Brazilian models in the class and stuff. And I was like, this guy's got it figured out. What is he doing here? He's just, 
he's coming to his class and he was a pharmaceutical salesman. So he was learning like how to public speak and all that. And I was like, oh man, but there was a bar right next door to it in uh, Union Square. So they would all like leave the class and then go hang out at the bar. So I was like, this seems okay. This seems okay. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to come back every time he's here. And one day I was there and, and, and when you look outside of acting, training is ridiculous. People are acting like polar bears and drinking fake teacups and like method acting style. And I was like watching this and I'd be laughing because I'd always be there for him, but I kept showing up. I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. And this teacher, I'll never forget her name, like Deborah Wiley was like, what do you find funny? And I said, this whole thing is kind of funny. And again, I'm wearing like bright yellow hill figure shirts and like, you know, I, this was not my world, but it was, it was interesting. It was interesting. It was hot models and people having fun. Right. And it was free. Like everybody was free and cool and doing their thing. So c cut to her and I, I'm there. I tell her my story. Some dude comes in to cast this independent film called Born at the Wrong Time. I don't even know. But it's about, it's like an American history X, but with drug dealing. And it's like a young, an older brother who gets out of prison, who's trying to right the wrongs that his younger brother's doing now, hustling, you know, in the streets. And I'm like, she's like, you should talk to the director. I was like, I don't even know. I don't know. Hey, she's like, just talk to him. Tell him what's up. He gave me the role. They shot the movie in Westchester. I had no idea how to act. But then after I did it, the movie never got finished. I went to my homeboys and I was like, yo, I'm going to move to L.A. And I'm going to like, I'm going to do this. Right. You liked it enough. You tasted it enough. I just thought this, this would be an amazing thing at 23 years old to kind of go after. And we all got in a car. We had a 74 Cadillac and like an 85 Civic and we drove. It took us 11 days to get to L.A. There were five of us. It was one of the best moments of my like the the most free times of my life i got to la i didn't know anything again the only discernible skill i had is hustling so i started like working in bars and figuring out that and then when i would fall back on if like i needed money i'd figure out ways to make money you know there because la was like a wide open place there wasn't many new yorkers there there was wasn't it was 99 it was right before the millennium and then i went there and uh I mean, working ever since I got like I started acting and I started doing like one line in Malcolm in the Middle to an Olsen twin movie. Like an actual, you did the real grind. I started as an extra. I'm an extra. I started, I literally did three extra jobs to get a sad card. And now you're Shades in one of the more popular Netflix series. Yeah. Yeah, got and, a bunch of movies coming out. And, and how many movies you have on the way? Two right now. Um, that are shot and done. Shot and done. With can you Ghost tell us about that? Yeah, Vault is my first true lead. It's a, it's a for, uh, film by the guys who did Bleed for this and Silence, the whole Scorsese crew. And uh, Wait, you're in a Martin Scorsese? No, no, no. He produced Bleed for this and, and he directed right, Silence producer. and it's all them, that whole team, Emma Koskoff, Nick Koskoff. And uh, it's a true story about 1972 bank heist. And it's the most, the largest unsolved bank heist they robbed in Providence, Rhode Island, $32 million. It was equivalent to like a hundred and something million now. Unsolved. Nobody ever knows about it. This mob bank. And it's this phenomenal story. Uh, and and you're the my, lead. Yeah. It's my you first popped. true whatever. He's out. I love stories. Though. I love the people who just, because everyone's path is different. Yeah. And I meet um, people whose path is, they're 20 years old. Uh, the other day, I was at WWE. I was talking backstage to a dude, who this dude Ricochet, who's popping, popping. I'm, I'm a mark, too. Oh, you are? Okay. okay. So you know, you, do you know Ricochet? I, I, I'm, You're a what? A mark, a wrestling fan. Yeah. They call you guys marks? You, we've yeah. talked about I hate when you play ignorant, like you haven't heard that term mark. before. Stop it. I don't remember mark. I'm like, mark I'm like an 80s. Like no, it's, it's a bad I'm an attitude error mark. mark. Yeah. He just recently came back because I was oh, doing a what and a what? And attitude, attitude era wrestling. Well, that's the Austin the Rock era. Era ever. Yeah. But I was in Bulgaria doing a movie, and one of the dudes in the movies was watching WrestleMania when the uh, when uh, the 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 brothers came back from the Hardys. The Hardys came back a year like, ago. The yeah, the Hardys are back. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I gotta watch this. And it drew you back. It drew oh, me that's back. The path and I, I went, went to SummerSlam at Brooklyn. Oh, there you go. And I had a moment because Randy Orton came up to me and said I was like his favorite actor. What? I lost my <laughs> yeah. Oh, so now you're hooked for life. Once Randy, by the way, Randy Orton doesn't come up and say anything nice to anyone. He was so nice to me. It was really? Crazy. Like now, Randy's not mean, but he is I someone live, who's. And I live down the block from the Undertaker now. And oh, in Austin. 
Wow, that's crazy. Are you buddies with it? Do you know him? Yeah, we just kind of, we have friends through my com- uh, my buddy's company, Roots of Fight, that he's been. Got it. Okay, wow, full circle. And that's yeah. how you got the same. I know Roots of Fight. Yeah, yeah, same guy. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I was I was talking to Ricochet, who just is now one of the big dudes in NXT, but he's like 32 years old, and he started popping, you know, NXT is the level below the, and we were talking about how he was happy to get there right now. There's another kid from the DMV, actually, who signed to NXT, who's going to probably go up to the main roster, who's 19, this kid Leo Rush, really talented. Leo's a kid. Ricochet's 32. They're both ill. Right, they're both really ill, but their paths are just totally different. And actors are like that too, right? Like some actors, twenty-two years old, they're everything. Yeah. Some actors, the big role comes when they're, you know, like I, I was watch, I watched Paul Giamatti show Billions, and I think about like Paul Giamatti was a grinder until private what? Parts. Until uh, WWE no, and, and even after Private Parts yeah. though, it really hovered until the Wine movie yeah. Sideways and that I, he became like a star in his forties or whatever. For me that. now doing this eighteen years, and I'm sure it's no different because I know a lot of athletes and I know a lot of people in you know hip hop. The thing is, I think that you have to live a life before you can be in this madness. Because if you say that again, you have to live a life. Meaning you have to have a story. You got to have some. How can I portray something realistically if I've never even come close to doing anything like it? You know what I'm saying? You could harness certain things. Like if you're real angry in a scene, you can harness the anger of a road rage moment and use that one second of harnessing that and put it into a story. But if you don't have moments in life, if you never felt heartbreak loss, you know, losing people unexpectedly at young ages how what are you going to pull from your training can only get you so far life has got to take you to a certain way and then also you can't appreciate people bringing you lattes and and treating you a certain way which is un not normal to 99.9 percent in the world you can't appreciate that if, if you get that at, well that's the thing if you get that at 19 you, get, you think you're it's fucked. like that and you're fucked and you think and that's life and being a good and and then the ability to be then be a good person that's becomes incredibly challenging because now you get to be the guy who is always nice to the extras because i wasn't extra. you were an extra and you're like of i know course. what it's like when i'm when, before i was a nobody i remember I, I choked out a first ad on a commercial because he was treating extras like hell like treating he was like literally like dirt and this was before there and was, that's the Staten know, Island came out. You said, I don't give right, a fuck what you do. the whole thing. I couldn't believe the way he was talking to people. I was like, and I was like, I would risk my whole, the no career that I had. In that moment. I can't let people talk to people like that. And it's changed. Thank God. I mean, we talk about the, you know, the struggles of social media and, and, and everything that's going on in the world. But there's so many positives that people don't talk about is authenticity as an all-time high. You can't get away with being a, being a, a, a sucker. Or anything. You can't just get away with being a for lack of a better word, like a douchebag now. Yeah. You can't. It doesn't work. And you, whatever you're portraying, if you're not authentic in it, people are going to find out. So what you say, you better mean. And that's kind of my thing now. Like in everything I do, all the people who follow me, everybody who knows me knows, I got no, this is who I am. I'm a family man first. I'm a vegan. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't do anything. Like, you know what I'm saying? Because I, I know how lucky I am to have what I have. So I'm going to make the best of it now. You know what I'm saying? Which is obviously with the water company, with all the stuff we're, we're doing is I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm good. I'm su- I got a lot of things I want to do, but I want to make other people's life better. And in today's world, it's real easy to sit here and talk about all the things that are wrong, but there's, you know, <laughs> there's so many things that are going on that are right people finding their voices right now we're, we're you know literally changing things by rising up by causing enough ruckus that things are changing on a government level on a big level and there's so much more to go but people didn't have these voices years ago at all they didn't feel the need to and now everybody feels the need to yeah different periods in our history as a country there's been you know obviously times where people have had voices, of course but they didn't have uh the international connection and support that you have now because of something that is a gift and a curse, which is social media and, you know, people in the media mm-hmm. with power that will also echo. You know, well, not only that, the, the world is, even though it's hard to see it right now because the people in power right now are so bad, the world has also evolved a lot. Not everybody, but a lot. And we're now all, so the, 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 there's more allies than there ever were before. 
there's a time when 50 years ago, if someone held up a cell phone, there are a lot more people who looked at them like, yeah, I still don't care. There are a lot more people now who are like, oh my God. And there's an impact there. It may not feel that way because the, right. the Stephen it's Millers and the dangerous. Jared Kushners. But it's also super dangerous because, you know, people who are saying the wrong thing can easily That's get that same it's a gift following. Yeah. It's a gift and, and then also people are recording things they probably shouldn't record, which, you know, it's just recently but happened. But it's also, too, it's hard to discern. It's tough for people to discern who to trust. That's right. That's going on right now. And right? We, don't, we don't believe, because again, because somebody will say that's fake. But, so we don't know what the truth is. And I think the only truth you have is, I think it's very easy to see who's truthful right up. That's why I say I can never believe. If someone tells me someone's like, yo, that person's the worst. You never met them. They're the worst. It's really hard for me. And I've, what I've learned to do is to just say, no, I have to meet them myself. Well, it's like when you That's walked a good in, you were like, yo, everybody to. I work with likes Rosenberg. Mm. And I was like, yeah, all right. right. And you were like, there's no way that's possible. Who do you work with? I guess I got to meet them because there's obviously <laughs> something wrong with them. Clearly something's going she, on. But she, the, the one girl who said it is nuts. So, you know, the two girls See, who said it. It was I'm, two girls, though. Two girls. Hot out here. Yeah. Both nuts. In their own way, yeah. But sure. you like them. <laughs> but you like them. You like them. I love them. <laughs> See, there you go. Okay, one last question. This um, is the last one? Yeah. Well, our, we, but oh, okay. this is important. All right. Am I able to have a hip-hop... I'm having a conversation. Uh, a dude texted me who always asked me hip-hop questions. Used to work with him. Nice kid. Okay. Loves rap. Not a hip-hop head, but like a nerdy dude who likes rap a lot. Okay. And he's like, what do you think about the Nas album, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, I think, I think this, I think that. He's like, yeah. Where, um, where's the sample from in Cop Shot the Kid? Please stop. Me. And I went, do you mean the... The vocal sample? He went, yeah, the, the vocal sample. I went, well, that's Slick Rick, children's story. It's one. It's a top 10 rap song ever made. I, th I'm, I'm capable of saying that. I believe that firmly. He went, oh, I'm not familiar with that song. I, I need to get my Slick Rick game up. I was like... You, you, wait, he's not a hip-hop. You're saying he is a hip-hop? No, he, he really loves... Like the last 10 years, he loves him. Well, that's why the last 10 years. But it reminds you, we're having conversations and arguments regularly with people who don't know where the cop shot the kid samples from. That's They're not wrong. It doesn't make them bad people. There's a lot of but people, it's, like when I talk about, there, there's people who are true hip-hop heads who don't listen to or never have listened to Sean Price or MF Doom. That's or different, anybody. though. I mean, there are people who don't go into that realm. But this is cop shot. Some of the greatest lyricists. But this is well, children's but that, story. But that's also, too, like you're on Luke Cage season two. It's up. Tonight, midnight. Yes, there are individuals who love Luke Cage and don't know anything about Marvel at all. Like, right? There's people yeah, who went right. out and saw Black Panther, and so the point is, don't judge. Yes. Help them. Say you should check it out. Here's a link. Yes. You should don't. check out. <laughs> yes, Children's Story is a so good song. You'll like it. Big Daddy came but on the ad. You know, this is a yeah. conversation we always have about people who are like, "Yo, I love B.I.G. What's your favorite song? Hypnotize, man." <laughs> You're like, all right. Yeah, it's a good song. It's a good song. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. I'd like to hear that one. <laughs> <laughs> At a party? Yeah, yeah sure, sure, sure. You are. Awesome. Theo Rossi, ladies and gentlemen, uh, <laughs> Luke Cage 2. Um, I don't know. Are we talking ounce water today? Are we talking we drinking water? We got to. How, how about you just hold it up and just say, hold it up. Is ounce the, water. One of the Listen, skews, I, guys. The skew <laughs> scenes are kind of. Uh, uh, this here, I got you guys. This you know what I'm is saying? He, if you see people they come in, they're drinking water. You know, that's what I drink. Ounce water, they send us water. Yes. I appreciate you, man. No, of course, man. You know, that is. I didn't know it would lead to interviewing Theo Rossi when we started getting water, but you know. Rosemary, you need to drink more ounce water. Uh, believe me, I drink lots of ounce water. How many how many are you taking down a day? Well, I was on a path of, of refilling this twice a day. Why would you have to refill it? We send you enough bottles. No, no, because I wanted you that's the point. <laughs> what I love about ounce water, watch this. What I love about ounce water is, you know it's 40 ounces. Yes. So I finish one bottle, I refill it once, and then I know I've already had 80 ounces for the so day. Good. And I'm good to go. Ounce water. <laughs> Theo, thank you, man. Luke Hayes tonight. <laughs>